before you jump into this. All right, so uh, my name's Tim. I'm a software developer at blockchain. And my background is in mobile development. I do iOS and Android in the past before I worked at blockchain. And now that's what I do. I do, I do that, Android and iOS, and uh, web, um, and JavaScript. So, I work, so at blockchain, I work on the web wallet, and the Android wallet, and the emerging app. So that's what I do at blockchain. All right, so I'm going to talk about the blockchain API. So, so why use the blockchain API? I mean, there's Bitcoin D, all that stuff, right? And for one, for one thing, well, blockchain, the blockchain API is dead simple to use. Um, it's basically a bunch of uh, um, HTTP requests that returns JSON objects. So let's see. Um, I mean, it's very easy to get started with. So for one here, I, actually, I want to gauge the audience. Um, how many people have a good understanding of uh, the blockchain, what it is, what the blockchain is, relative to Bitcoin? Okay, actually that's very good. Uh, how about, do you, another, another raise of hand, do you, how many of you guys have a really deep understanding of blockchain, like inputs, outputs, scripts, and lock time? Can you guys raise your hand, raise your hand if you know about that? Okay, uh, that's good. Okay, so now, now I know what to talk about. All right. So here's the blockchain. Let's, let's start diving into a very simple one. Uh, well, for one, blockchain, for, the, for those of you guys who, who are new, I think some, some people didn't raise their hands. Um, what, block, what the blockchain is, it's basically a rec, uh, record of all transactions that ever existed in the Bitcoin network from, from the beginning of time. So that's what, that's what the blockchain is all about, transactions. And with our API, you can very easily uh, query out get transactions. You could get it by <laughs> this request here. By giving it a text index, which is specific to the block, uh, our blockchain site, but you, most people would probably use the hash to return it, uh, the transaction object, which is all I'm shown right here. Okay. So a transaction. And it's a hash of, of what exactly? Of the entire. Transaction. Oh yes, uh, the, the transaction. Okay. But is it is the hash also part of the transaction in the blockchain, or is this is a separate thing that? Oh no, the, the hash covers. Uh, I think every everything, uh, from all these uh, variables. Wait, I think uh, starting. Oh no, actually no. A transaction. These are specific to blockchain. The relay. I think the size and fee out fee in. I think that's specific to to our API. Um, but. I can show you what a uh, transaction object looks like. Yeah, transaction hash covers the uh, yes the lock the end lock time, the uh, inputs and outputs. But yeah, that's that's what transaction hash. Uh, uh, it's a, I think it's a double SHA two fifty six hash of of those data right here, and then that's a, that will make up the hash. This API request you could get. Uh, data on the address. Are all of you guys familiar with um, these variables right here? Hand raise, yes or no? Yes. I, I have a question. Yes. I, I noticed that on your website some addresses have been labeled, mm -hmm. like that have some significance. Uh, is it possible to get those labels through this API? I, I don't think so, no. I think that's specific to uh, my wallet. I think you label it in my wallet. Uh, no, no, just on public chain info. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you just go to the website and you look at certain addresses, like the Silk Road funds that have been taken by the FBI, it's, I, I believe it's labeled it, when you go on the site. Or different, like uh, the Satoshi Bitcoin, you know, they've got a name attached to it. Yeah. To my knowledge, I don't think you can get that data through an okay. API. Yeah. But I could be wrong, but I could double check on that and maybe post that later. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and here, you get a. This, this API request, you can get um, data on an address, basically, all the transaction data. Right here, listen. Yeah, if you use this API request, you pass in an address, you can get. Data on the address and also all the transactions involving the address. 
And this is a very neat one because in order, if you want to do offline transactions, you would need to first get the output of the previous transaction that you want to claim. And um, they take care of requests and let you get the data right, and spin outputs. These are all the, all the data that you need to create an offline transaction. What you do is, if you want to create an offline transaction, you can take the data that's being returned by this, and you could probably use some service like BrainWallet or something to sign your own transaction offline. Here's our WebSocket API. How many of you are familiar with WebSockets? All right, great. Not, not everyone? Okay. So, this is an example of, um, if you've ever seen our, our homepage website with the, the real-time data of, of blockchain, that's, they're based on WebSockets. <laughs> right here. All this data coming out done on WebSockets, real time. All um, transactions being broadcast in the network are all shown here. So there's a label going right there, Satoshi Dice. Oh, huh. I guess it can be one. So, I did, so it does use WebSockets and does return that, so I guess oh, so it is okay. labeled. Hmm. I want to demo. Uh, so. And you can and you can listen uh, use WebSockets to listen to this data too and build your, whatever your own application with, with WebSockets. Uh, but first, let's go on. Let's look at how to use WebSockets. Basically, you use you open up a, a WebSocket con WebSocket connection, and you will subscribe to certain things like if you want to get data of all new transactions coming in, or if you want to get uh, uh, blocks, uh, all data on all new blocks coming in real time. You can use what you do is open up a WebSocket connection, and if, when, when you open, you send a message like this. If you want to, if you want to listen to all unconfirmed transactions, transactions that are being broadcasted by a network, you can send this message. Is there a limit on how long you can stay connected to that socket? Or I think as long as you want. I think. Yeah. And no, no limits on. Like uh, amount of, I guess in WebSocket it's it's uh, different, but in the JSON interface, number of requests per second or something. Like that. Oh yes, there is a limit for that the uh, HTTP request. Oh. And if you want to bypass the limit request, you need to get an API key from us. And, I see. Yeah. So back to the WebSocket. I'm gonna more WebSocket. How many, of, how many of you guys are familiar with Python? All right, good. Here's a sample um, Python script that uses WebSockets. Right here. All right. What does this Python script do? Okay, yeah, I'm going to explain that. Right. So basically, here's what's what happened in main. You, you, first, you do a WebSocket connection. And you pass in all these uh, methods uh, right here. And when you and when WebSockets on open returns, first, what I'm doing right now, I send in these messages after the uh, WebSocket open, which is uh, I, sus I subscribe to the unconfirmed, unconfirmed transaction stuff, and blocks, and, and this, this address. So if I run the script, I will listen to all trend. Uh, so what happens. And what it's doing right now is just outputting everything that's, all, the, all these are basically the, the unconfirmed transactions there. The same thing that you see in the front page right here. Yeah. So right. Yeah. can you also subscribe to the blockchain and get um, the blockchain sent through a WebSocket via like this? So you get a JSON uh, object describing the confirmed blocks? Yes, you get to subscribe to confirmed blocks and, 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 un, and unconfirmed transactions and a specific address. Does is the script does is it prints out any transaction. Well, first it listens to all what this WebSocket listens to all the unconfirmed transactions, and then only but it only prints out the transaction if the output is over a certain thresh threshold, and that threshold is is set is defaulted to zero. But you can pass in an argument on the script, and it gets set. So if I do I do 
account. 10. What this script will do will only print out transactions <coughs> that. There you go. Let's call it move on. Uh, I think I talked about the API already. Yeah. Uh, what's on it? Now, what, what's next? I think I set it up where I. <coughs> Uh, here, here's an example of a. I can't see the bottom. But, um, here's a sample of uh, someone. This Bitlisten. Who ever heard of the Bitlisten? You guys heard of it? Yeah, basically, it uses our website API. Here's a sample of an app that someone got, some guy made. So very nice app. It just, this is an UI. It just shows up transactions and bubbles. When, when, a, uh, when a block comes out, there's like a surge. Really. So, yeah. Oh, wait, no, no, this, this is just an unconfirmed transaction, so. But I, I, I'm sure I've noticed, like, when looking at this, that when, it, when, like a, when a new block's published, there's like, it's almost like it catches up or something. There's no basis for that. It could be, I guess, but um, from my understanding how the Bitcoin network works, it just relays transactions, so I don't see why a block would. Um, well, it depends on how the API is structured. Yeah. I mean, if, if you were going to. If any transactions that you hadn't published, but then the block comes, you're like, oh, there are a bunch of transactions that we had never relayed. Okay. You know, then, then it might like, you know, play catch up. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, that's a reasonable argument. Bit mixing might cause a whole bunch of other ones. Anyway. All right. So here's I show this. Yeah, this this slide uses the R web socket API. Now let's move on. Uh, I was talking about yeah the unspent output is an interesting API request. I use it a lot to sign uh, to offline transactions. What I what I would do is I would use this request to get the unspent outputs, and I would take it and use it on my to my offline computer, and then to, to sign an offline transaction. And, and this is a very useful uh, API method. And and Frame Wallet uses this, this API method. If you look in Frame Wallet. And you can see, see this uh, CM user API, we just download the link. The unspent output of this address right there. So very cool. And you can use, use this, uh, use this uh, offline. Pretty well, you can save it to, to an offline computer and use that this way. It's just to sign offline transactions. And you can, it's really cool, really neat. Neat way to use our API. Okay, here's our, here's our, create, uh, our create wallet API. Yeah, I think, yes. With the, with the uh, wallet API, you will need an API key. Or oh, well, in the past, they used our API to, to uh, create new wallets for uh, new coming, incoming users. We want to claim the tips. Our create, uh, create wallet. What's interesting about our wallet API is that you can use the Bitcoin client, Bitcoin D client, to to get data on our wallet, on the wallet. So how many of you guys use Bitcoin D, or it's now called Bitcoin Core? Yeah, a couple, a couple of you, yeah. Yeah, it's, so if you ever use that, you could use the same commands, basically, to to interface with your My Wallet. So I have a, so, but not, 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 but not all methods are, are allowed, some for, uh, for security reasons. So let's go down. Yes, yeah, so like for example, get info, a very basic API method they could use for for uh, Bitcoin on for Bitcoin D. So here, I'll show you an example a request. Okay, here, a sample of, you can see this is a Bitcoin D client, and it, all you do is pass in to connect to our uh, <coughs> inter to interface of our JSON, Bitcoin D, JSON, uh, RPC API, you just do this. You pass in the URL, the, the port, and your wallet ID, and your RPC password, and you can use this.
and the other ones that won't get balanced. For, for, for any guys who have, are getting any butt ideas, that balance is just a watch only address. So yeah, okay. don't bother trying to steal it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but when you do it, use a uh, Bitcoin D JSON, JSON API, it does, you, our wallet, our servers do decrypt your wallet and it does, does see your private key. So you have to be careful, remember, keep that in mind. Unless you use the uh, double encryption uh, in our wallet. So, so, but when you, so when you, when you use our uh, JSON API, API servers, um, for a lot of times you don't need you, you don't need to send transactions. You just want to receive transactions, so you don't have to use. Uh, we don't have to see your private keys when you use this API. Yeah, all the basic functions are there. If you if you are familiar with the Bitcoin D, these are familiar. You should look familiar. Transaction, all that stuff. Okay. Okay, let's move on to. Oh, oh besides using Bitcoin D to, to interact with the wallet API, you can also just use regular eight uh, requests. Um, for example, if you want to make a payment, again, use this method right here. Is this cheaper than using BitPay? Well, this is when you receive address, and I guess essentially it was just receiving payments. The sender pays a fee, though, so I don't, so as a merchant, it wouldn't matter to you, I guess. This, does, this doesn't convert into, into any kind of currency; it just stays with Bitcoin. Yeah, it's, stable, it's just stable, stable Bitcoin. Oh, okay. Okay. But there's no reason why you could forward the the amount to uh, say an exchange and exchange the bitcoins for dollars. Well, it could be more extra legwork on you to sell for you, but it's possible. Yeah. Again, you could send many, or you could. Yeah, fetching wallet balance, you don't have to decrypt. We have the, the second password. You don't, uh, our servers won't see the, your private keys. Yeah, let's think that you don't need to decrypt your, your private keys. Okay. Yeah, all, all these methods are all listed here very cleanly. Very cleanly. And what's next? Okay. Yeah, query API. And again, this is our another simple, um, a simple uh, list of API methods you could use <coughs> to get uh, data. Like, like here's an interesting one. For example, you want to see the, the probability of finding a valid block attempt, block of each hash attempt. Okay. This is interesting. Okay. So if you're a miner or something, and you want to figure out how, how likely you are to mine Bitcoin. So that's like one over the difficulty or something? Uh, yeah, so you probably use, you use the difficulty and the hash rate, mining current mining. Like how much hashing power you have compared to the network. And there's a likelihood of you. For each hash, you have this probably if you getting, winning, uh, getting the correct hash with the correct nouns is this. So what is the update rate of this data from the query API? Actually, I'm not sure. I think I have to ask Ben, but I think it, hmm. I think it's pretty up to date. Well, I think it's updated on each uh, change in difficulty, probably, most likely. And you compare it to to the real and compared to real time with the hashing rate of the network. Okay. So okay, so receive payment API. It's very easy to use. All, only two get requests, and you could using this API method, you could start accepting bitcoins on your website or whatever app right away, very easily. Our merchant app uses this API method. Okay, I'll, I'll show you an example. I'll show you an API request. Like if I want to receive a payment from you and I want to request it through the blockchain API, mm -hmm. I... You call this method. First you do this. Okay. So say you want to... 
send Bitcoin to here is your address. All you do is call the API method, and you, if it's successful, you return a, a destination to that and be and the input address. So what are what we do is we just all you do is ask your user to send Bitcoin to here and to this address, and our service will immediately forward the, the Bitcoin to that address. Instant. So it, it does require a little bit of trust on our side, mm -hmm. but very, very, very tiny uh, split second. Well, as long as the transaction is valid, get the other Bitcoin nodes will relay it. So it's technically you could possibly send the transaction before it to uh, so relay the transaction even though there's no input, the inputs, inputs have not been sent to that address. Uh -huh. But as long, but when it gets when it gets added to the block, then it will start verifying the transaction. So when the miners will decide it. So what's the advantage of doing this? Why wouldn't I just generate a new address? Yes, you can. But uh, it's, again, it's, it's a higher level system. You don't have to have a, some software to generate the addresses for you. But yeah, it's totally possible if you do it yourself on on, on your servers or on your, whatever on your software, your web application. So the point is to show the customer a unique address, basically. If you want to, yes, I would highly recommend to to use a unique address, like, like because people think Bitcoin is super, like anonymous or pseudonymous, but it's not, it's actually really really public. You could probably easily find out someone else's yeah, how much how much Bitcoin someone else has had just by asking them to send you some Bitcoins, and you just look up look it up and look look back. And and again, it's very simple, that simple to use. I, our API, again, it's just a bunch of HTTP requests that returns a JSON object. Very simple and easy to use. Do you guys have the average price? Average price? Yeah. Um, yeah, they have the price. Yeah. They have the charge for the price, but it's not average, I think. Go back to the charts. Charts. Uh, to the list. Last charts and list. I want to see the market price back. Same API, you can use convert, get it in JSON format as CSV. I think that's all the API. Uh, I think I just want to do all of them. Thank you very much, Dan, and thank you, Tim. Awesome.